Welcome to Cancer Talks, a podcast sharing stories of personal transformation and collective healing from people who have been touched by cancer. My name is Claire DeLazlo, and I'll be guiding today's conversation. My guest today is Wyatt Pickner. Wyatt is Hunkpati Dakota from the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. He's currently the research manager at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, whose focus is healing with culture and reclaiming indigenous health. Wyatt grew up on the Crow Creek Indian Reservation and now lives and works in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He uses his master's in public health to improve the well being of Native communities across the United States. For the past 10 years, he's worked with tribes, tribal organizations, and Native serving organizations at local, regional, and national levels on research projects, capacity building, training, and community engagement. Hi, Wyatt. Welcome to Cancer Talks. Hi, thank you for having me. So sometimes I like to open with this question, which is, what is your earliest memory of cancer? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know, I I think growing up, there were many different people in my family and my community that would often, you know, get sick or um, weren't doing well. And I never really understood or, or knew uh, what was going on. I just knew that there, you know, something was wrong with them and that they weren't doing okay. So I don't know if there's a specific, you know, my earliest memory of cancer, but I know that there have been, you know, several different, more impactful instances of cancer in my family. Um, You know, people that I've been close with and just like the ways in which, you know, it showed up and how it affected my family and my community. So, yeah, I don't know if I have a a specific uh, earliest memory of cancer, but I know I definitely had, you know, different family members and people that I was close to that have had cancer. Were any of those close people's like cancer experiences particularly formative for you and your work now? Yeah, so... I think the one that the, the biggest one that I often, you know, share with a lot of people is uh, my Auntie Helen, who, you know, was the very first person to hold me when I was born uh, and was with my mom in the delivery room. And, um, you know, she was someone, a, a role model uh, for me growing up, uh, was always there for me as, you know, I was going through different things. Uh, she lived with us for, a while as well. And, you know, just taught me life lessons uh, as I was growing up. You know, she taught me how to tie my shoes and, you know, always encouraged me to like go to school and do well. You know, she was someone that experienced a lot of different health issues uh, throughout her life. And she was often tell me like, you need to go to school and, you know, figure out, you know, we need people um, to help take care of us and make sure that we're healthy and well. And so she always encouraged me to go to school and was always so happy when I'd come back from school and just like give her all the updates on, you know, what I was doing. And it was around the time that I was, I want to say my second year of college that she was diagnosed with breast cancer and, you know, fought it for about a year or two and then was in remission and then started having, you know, some pain and not really knowing what it was, uh, went in to get checked and uh, it had come back and was very advanced stage and, you know, ultimately didn't have a very good prognosis and ended up passing away a few weeks later after uh, she went in to get checked, which interestingly enough was almost to the minute, you know, from when I was born. And so unfortunately passed away on my birthday, but was just an interesting kind of experience of, you know, from when I came into this world and when she left and having that connection. And just because of the role that she played in my life, you know, I recognize and reflect on the the things that she told me and taught me of, you know, going to figure out how to help our family, our community. And so really carried that with me. And when I think about the, or when I experience challenging times going through the obstacles of navigating, you know, public health and research and cancer, all of this work, 
I think about her and the experiences that she has or that she had throughout her life and use that as my motivation to continue. And despite all the, you know, issues and challenges that she experienced in her life, I always remember that she had this incredible sense of humor and she would always, you know, laugh and joke about, you know, different things. Even in the most serious moment, she could always make, you know, people laugh. And it was just really fantastic. She was uh, such a fantastic person. And I just feel, you know, so lucky to have her, to have had her in my life and still, you know, carry a lot of that, those memories and the things that she taught me with me. Yeah. Could you describe a little bit about your current research process with the American Indian Cancer Foundation? Yeah, so at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, the research that we do tends to be more community-oriented, community-driven, community-based. Um, so it's not so much doing work in a you know clinical setting and very scientific lab setting, but the work that we do is still very much very scientific, still, um, just in ways that I think you know a lot of people don't really see, because I think you know our at ACAF, um, we do believe that our communities have the knowledge and wisdom to the solutions for the issues that, you know, they're faced with. And oftentimes they're looking for that organizational capacity, um, expert input or resources to make those solutions a reality. And so we apply that belief to our approach um, in doing research where, you know, we don't go in and pose questions ahead of time or hypotheses ahead of time to the communities that we're working with. And so oftentimes it's going in and saying, you know, how are things going, taking an assessment of just like, what are the challenges or issues or priorities of the community, including sometimes it's not an issue or a challenge, but it's asking what's working and what are the successes and, you know, what do we want to lift up? Because sometimes that is the better approach to cancer prevention is figuring out the the good things that are happening. And so, you know, coming in and starting by listening to the community and just hearing from them about what they would like to share and what research um, priorities they have, what data priorities they have, uh, and how we can help um, address some of those things and meet the community where they're at, basically. What are some of the most common things that people ask for like from you in your work? I think a lot of the times it's just trying to get to an understanding of what cancer is, um, how to prevent it. Um, you know, some, I guess maybe it's like kind of myth busting or um, helping to just provide some clarification on some of the things that happen. For instance, one thing I think that will happen a lot of the times is moving from cancer screening that oftentimes if people go in for a cancer screening and get a result that requires them in to go in for more, te more testing, sometimes they make that jump from a screening into that they have cancer. And oftentimes that, you know, can be a big hurdle to overcome of saying, you know, this is just like that first stage and trying to figure out if there's a bigger issue uh, and more, you know, need for concern. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, that we'll hear is, you know, just trying to get people in to get screened because I think like that's a big, I guess, concern within our communities is that oftentimes we don't catch cancer until it's too late in the those later stages. And so if we're able to increase cancer screening rates um, and hopefully catch, you know, things at an earlier stage, they have different options. But oftentimes if you wait until later stages, you're going to have, you know, not as good of results. So that's a big thing is trying to provide education and awareness on cancer screenings and not just like who's, I mean, part of it is, you know, who's eligible um, and what that looks like um, because eligibility criteria can vary and getting it covered by, you know, insurance and a lot of those different pieces. But you know, it can also be a scary experience as well. Sometimes, you know, they have to do different things. Um, and that's to get the, the screening done, like mammograms, colonoscopies, you know, CT scans, uh, different things. And a lot of that experience of going through that process can be scary for people, um, especially if they've had negative health experiences in the past. 
And so another part of the work that we try to do is provide that education and awareness on, you know, what that process looks like, what to expect, um, including, you know, so um, some of that is that education and awareness. But sometimes if we don't have the knowledge and information on what those barriers and uh, challenges that our community members and relatives are facing, then we don't know how to address them. And so that's some of the work that I do is trying to, again, go into the community and listen and trying to understand what those challenges are so that we can develop resources that are relevant and appropriate in multiple different levels so that, you know, people can be more informed and get their cancer screenings ahead of time so that hopefully we can catch these things a lot earlier. So you said like when you were a kid and thinking about people having cancer, you didn't quite understand like what was going on. I'm wondering now how you would describe like what cancer is or like if you're trying to raise that awareness, maybe from like a structural perspective or more specifically. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think, you know, there's a lot of stories that can come from, you know, different communities around the country on, you know, how cancer showed up in our communities. Because I was, you know, often taught and told that cancer didn't exist in our communities prior to colonization. And so, um, you know, I look at the different things that have been introduced since colonization and how that has really influenced our the health and well-being of Indigenous communities. And so, you know, I think about the, the things that put into our bodies, uh, how we interact and engage with each other, this idea of, you know, what it means to take care of yourself and to take care of others. And so to me, I almost think of like cancer as one of the effects of when we're not doing that. It's this illness that comes in and this thing that, you know, kind of takes over different parts of your body and breaks it down so that you're not able to function. And so that's how I kind of conceptualize cancer in this other, I guess, realm. But I guess more scientifically, if I were to, you know, even just talk with like one of my relatives or family members, again, sometimes I think they've become well acquainted with um, the idea of cancer. But oftentimes I, I think that there's this idea that if you're told you have cancer, that it's like a death sentence. And I don't think that that's necessarily what it is anymore. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress that has been made around that. So. A few steps back in your own work in public health, I was reading about your work at the Urban Indian Health Institute in Seattle, and their mission is to decolonize data for Indigenous people by Indigenous people, which is a really powerful mission. And I'm, I wonder if you could break down what it looks like to decolonize data and, and also maybe like lay out for some listeners who might not really make that connection between colonial structures and the origin of data. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So my work uh, that I did with the Urban Indian Health Institute was really a fantastic experience. And, you know, again, another opportunity where I've learned so much and continue to carry a lot of that knowledge and information with me now um, and use it in the work that I do. So there's this idea that, I guess, Western methods ideas, concepts, structures have been, you know, designed and built by non-Native people, primarily, you know, non-Hispanic white individuals um, that set up systems and structures to dismantle Indigenous communities and initially to uh, terminate them or, you know, get rid of them. Uh, and when a lot of those processes weren't working, I think there were efforts to, you know, assimilate a lot of indigenous cultures into mainstream society and culture by their own standards. But I don't think what was realized was this, uh, like the strength and the resilience uh, that our indigenous communities have, because, you know, despite all of those efforts, we are still here today. And um, even though there may be some health issues and challenges um, that our communities are faced with, uh, we continue to overcome those and we are still here. And I think that as we have continued to be here, there are these efforts in recognizing that, again, Indigenous communities have uh, significant uh, knowledge systems and that 
we are um, still kind of fighting that battle of, you know, whose knowledge and history or, you know, information is more right or wrong. I don't, and I don't know if there is a right or wrong, but I know that for our communities, there's a different approach to some of those things. And that, um, you know, a lot of these uh, structures or institutions, you know, haven't been based in the knowledge and wisdom of our communities. And so, of course, their systems and methods and data and evidence is not going to relate directly to the work that's going on here. And so, you know, when we talk about decolonizing data by Indigenous people for Indigenous people, it's really lifting up that, um, those knowledge systems, practices, protocols, um, going back to our traditional value systems. I believe that, like, as Indigenous people, even if you don't explicitly know that, you know, or uh, can identify something as a traditional practice. I feel like there's a feeling that you just do something because it's part of, you know, who you are and where you come from. You know, oftentimes I think in Western academia and research, we look at socioeconomic factors as key indicators of people's health and well-being, which I think have some very valid foundation um, and can help predict those things. But I also think that there are other factors that aren't looked at and well things that aren't well known for indigenous communities. I often will use the idea of salaries and income. You know, when we look at uh, what someone's income is, the people who tend to have higher incomes have better health outcomes. But I also look at, you know, the idea of resources and uh, that concept of like money within our structure um, our indigenous like structures and community systems and sometimes those don't relate in the same way that they do to mainstream society you know a lot of the finances that i i get i often and sharing those with other people in my family or community and so i always joke that i'm like i don't think i'm ever going to you know be a rich person or, you know, have all of this money um, because all the money I get, I still give to other people. And that's something that a lot of our families and communities embody this idea that when you get some of those finances or, you know, those resources, you share them with your family and community. But we don't have a way to track that and document that. And so there's no evidence around that. And I think that's one of these, you know, indigenous determinants of health and a factor that can go a long way and influence someone's health and well-being. I also look at things like the support that you get from your family and friends, your community, in terms of being there, showing up for people, and how that can influence, you know, someone's health and well-being. When I look at the way in which elders are taken care of mainstream society compared to our indigenous communities. I see that, you know, elders are held to have a higher level of respect in our communities, that we go to them for knowledge and wisdom, that we continue to take care of them. You know, my my grandma is going to be 94, um, also a breast cancer survivor. And I think about the ways um, in which she's still very active and involved in so much of our family, in our community, that she's continues to, you know, stay connected with some, so many of those different things. And that when those things go away, in those relationships, those connections aren't there, um, that it does really influence their health and well-being. And so, again, looking at the these other factors that because we don't have a quick and easy way to document and have hard, quote unquote, evidence that these things are influencing, you know, what's going on within, you know, someone's body, then it becomes this other thing that is not real. And so... That's why, again, I think my approach with the work that we do is when I look at the approach of, I guess, Western academia and mainstream society, and there's all these ideas of like uh, evidence-based interventions or evidence-based XYZ, I often question like whose evidence because oftentimes Native communities aren't included in a lot of things or if we are, we're such a small sample or a, uh, a small portion of 
that data and information that it's hard to interpret things um, in a way that's useful and meaningful. And oftentimes that's also not helpful, even if you were to go through and do some of that, because, you know, if you were to try to analyze a lot of that high level data, what's that going to mean for an individual community? How is an individual community going to use something that isn't representative of their population? And so that's where we need community specific, population specific data information and data and information. And that's what a lot of the work that we've been doing at ACAF is working with individual communities to figure out what are the data points, the research uh, priorities that they're interested in, and using those to move the work forward and making sure that information that we're collecting is going to be relevant and useful and that we're not collecting it just to just because, you know, we're kind of interested in it or there's some funding available. We have to make sure that it relates to the programming and uh, work that's going on within the community. And so all of these um, things, concepts, ideas that I'm talking about relate to that idea of, you know, decolonizing data and even the idea of what we interpret data to be. Oftentimes, I think people um, think of it as, you know, survey data or data that you can pull from a medical chart record or, you know, numbers and statistics and facts. Uh, those sort of things are how they view data. But I also have this idea of what if we thought about data as a living thing, a being, and how would we engage and interact with it? What are the values and protocols and practices around that versus just like this, you know, thing that that we ask uh, and goes into the computer and whatever else. But again, you know, thinking about that ahead of time uh, in terms of how we collect it, why we collect it, what we do with it afterwards, how we give it back, how we interpret it. There's so many different, you know, considerations that we have to think about because that also relates to an individual. Um, you know, if I go ask someone to tell me their story or their experience, you know, with a healthcare system, they're they're sharing a piece of them with me. And I, I have to treat that story and experience uh, with a lot of intention and care and make sure that I'm not misinterpreting information, that I'm not using it in a way that um, wasn't intended. And a lot of these concepts, I think, still relate to some of the basic principles of Western research and academia. But I think it's just through a different lens that a lot of non-Indigenous people might not fully understand because it's not their worldview. It's not how they were raised, uh, some of those pieces. But that's why, you know, we need to have these sort of things done um, of decolonizing these practices because it's helping us get back to closer to what our traditional practices, values, protocols, life ways were pre-colonization. I don't know that we'll ever fully get there. I think that there's also these ideas around what does it mean to decolonize this and that, and that sometimes it's overused which I don't know, I guess could be true, but I, I think that there's still, ultimately there's this idea that we do need to invest and lift up the knowledge and wisdom of our communities. Um, that's where it starts. That's what it goes back to. And I think that's the primary idea of what we're trying to get at is, you know, what is the data that our communities need and how can we help collect that data to actually inform and develop solutions that are meaningful and impactful. I love this idea of data as a living being. And yeah, I think there's so much there. I wonder if you could give an example of another like value that feels like a value from your ancestry that you like grew up with that is currently informing your work. Yeah. Um so I think, you know, we touched on, I think, like the financial kind of resources aspect. And so I think that relates Sorry. to generosity. Um, I think there's this idea of support and like compassion and empathy and hearing people's stories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there is, I'm trying to think of uh, another one that is more directly related to some of the, the work that I can provide an example on. You know, I think just this idea of like, cultural connectedness and being connected to your family and community. And so I think, you know, oftentimes people look to 
Native people and have certain ideas or stereotypes in, in their mind of like what makes something Native or Indigenous. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes are like, in order for you to be uh, Native, you have to participate in, you know, powwow dancing or you have to do X, Y, Z. But you know, being an indigenous person is so much more than, you know, what you see in the media and movies and all of those different things. Like, you know, it, I think it's more about practicing uh, some of these other protocols. Again, like, you know, we touched on also respect for elders, respect for community, uh, respect for data and giving that back in, our, in, in a way that's appropriate and intentional. I think there's also this idea of I'm trying to think of what the right word would be. Oftentimes when I think about non-native people that want to work with our communities and do research or, you know, any kind of work and trying to come back to that idea of like, why do you want to do this work? Why do you want to work with this population? Because it will get challenging and tough. And if you don't have a strong foundation in your why, when it gets hard, you're going to leave in a lot of our communities have experienced that where, you know, people come in, collect what they want, do what they want, and then they leave. And so, you know, I think that's why there's a lot of challenges around uh, trying to work with Native communities and develop solutions that work, because it will also be, you know, limited in terms of the timeline based on funding. And so I think uh, working to develop that good foundation so that you can build that trust in a long-term relationship with the community um, and do some good work that's sustainable in knowing and trusting in the community, but also it's, you know, not about being the one to like take credit for all the different things, because I think our community very much works in, you know, not so much in always in a hierarchical kind of system of, um, you know, that this person, this one person or a couple people get power, but really a, a broader community approach of saying like this knowledge and information uh, comes from the community and is for the community. And so, you know, even in the work that I do, I can appreciate, you know, peer reviewed journal articles in doing some of that work uh, and sharing some of that knowledge and information. But at the same time, I'm also very hesitant to do some of that because it's ultimately not always my information or my stories to be shared. And that, you know, is more appropriate to come from the, the, the community or the individuals themselves. And I feel like I have a bigger responsibility to communicate data information processes uh, to our community partners and our relatives at that level over, you know, other scientists you know, and so I think what I tend to be more motivated to put into Western academia and some of those ar journal articles are the processes and approaches, frameworks, ideas of how they should be working with indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, that kind of goes back to, you know, again, that idea of one of those values or I don't know what the right uh the right word for it would be, um, but it's just like maybe intentionality. And the reason that you you do this work, you know, it's not for yeah. so much for Your just motives. yourself. Yeah. yeah, yes, exactly. Motives. Because again, for me, based on my life experience and, you know, especially around cancer, I do this so that my a lot of my family and relatives, my community doesn't have to go through as many hard experiences like this. You know, I... It, if we could come up with the the prevention for cancer instead of the cure for cancer, yeah. you know, why why have to go through all of that heartache and hardship of, you know, having to get treatments and do all of all these different things versus preventing it from happening. But in order to do that, I think we also have to go back and, you know, learn the history and context of what created all of these health disparities that our communities are facing. Um, you know, it's not just individual choice and behavior. Oftentimes our communities are in a challenging situation where there might not be a good option uh, for people to to make healthy choices and lifestyle behaviors. Um, there's not always the resources to do that. And, it, you know, the, the I think within um, mainstream society, there's, there's this idea that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. And that's not always the case. 
uh, for a lot of our communities. But despite all of that, again, there is so much strength. Uh, there's so much knowledge and information, so many amazing things that come out of our communities. But that's usually not the story that's told. It's always the bad things. There's also so many good programming things that happen in our communities, but because they're not backed by the data and evidence that are deficit-based, they don't often get funded. And so as Indigenous people, we tend to just make those things happen and we, you know, we'll figure out how to make it work. You know, you'll go and maybe you have to do your day job, but then you go help to take care of your your auntie or your cousin and you give them a ride someplace and you help them get their you know food or whatever else that they might need or maybe it's just going sitting and visiting with them and talking with them sharing story and you know asking them how their day is and we just do that because that's who we are and i think that that's an approach to cancer prevention is yeah. doing some of those sort of things. But again, there's no funding that necessarily helps to support those um, in a way that's sustainable. For listeners, could you just describe a little bit what deficit-based thinking is? Yeah, so it's you know more around identifying only the issues or challenges, the problems that exist. So, you know, again, Native people or indigenous populations are often, you know, described in data and journal articles as having, you know, the worst health outcomes, um, the highest rates of diabetes and cancer and all these health issues. And so we talk about health disparities. And so oftentimes we're, we're up there of like, you know, again, all those chronic illnesses and diseases, all the highest risk factors. In some instances, I've even seen native or indigenous communities populations being de described as risk factors for illness and disease wow. and like that is not okay you know me as an indigenous person am not a risk factor for xyz Absolutely. um and so you know there are other things that put us at risk for those things and that again that's just where a lot of stereotypes are born out of is that deficit based thinking that we're the problem, but not looking at what the context of the problem is in understanding, you know, someone didn't choose to just have this life experience. But if you're forced to go through that process and sit with those, you know, decisions of like, what would you have done, then it becomes a whole different situation of trying to understand what that experience looks like. Well, we could like flip that on its head, right? If they're saying like being Indigenous is a risk factor. It's like, okay, so colonization and displacement are risk factors for cancer, which no, I mean, no one would ever go out and mm -hmm. I, I'd love to read it. You, maybe you'll write an article about, <laughs> about that as a risk factor. The way you were describing the deficit based thinking, in, like specifically in how data is talked about and represented, just really reflects, I think, how the whole cancer conversation the mainstream discussion of cancer is deficit-based is such a good word for that because that's kind of our main focus as a podcast is trying to talk about cancer in ways that are uplifting, preventative, healing. Like what are, what are all the resources that we have that are not given to us from the pharmaceutical industry or from your first oncologist, whatever, there's so much that's not that's often not talked about because a lot of even like blogs or Facebook groups are just everybody talking about how terrible everything is and like how how gloomy it is, which is real. Like it's very heavy, but then your work is at the intersection of indigenous communities, which are often spoken about in this deficit mindset and cancer, which is the same fate. And it's like that intersection is really a lot to push back against. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, again, I, I feel like a lot of the perspective that I have, you know, is definitely based in the experiences that I've had with my family and uh, friends and community who've unfortunately experienced cancer. 
And at the same time, a lot of it comes from those cancer survivors or the people that, you know, went through that experience of saying, you know, here's what I experienced. Here's what would be better. You know, I wish I did this or I wish I did that. And that ultimately, I mean, there's so many instances where it's like we're constantly, I feel like, looking for this this magic pill or, you know, cure. But again, I think so much of it goes back to how we take care of ourselves, how we take care of other people, being brought up with those traditional values and lessons of like, here's what it means to show up for your family, relatives and, you know, community. And what that means to be a good relative is one of our, you know, things that we will often say in some of our campaign messaging uh, through ACAF. But just in general, that's something I've heard people say throughout Indian country is, you know, be a good relative, take care of each other. And I feel like there's this underlying or deeper meaning that I think a lot of Indigenous people know what you mean when you say that. Um, And sometimes it's really hard to explain, but when you hear it, you're just like, I know what that means. (laughs) Yeah. I'm thinking about, I think in some ways the, I don't want to say answers, but things that could be healing and could help the cancer epidemic in a way they're like right under our nose or like we already know a lot of what we need to prevent cancer, heal from cancer, but under capitalism and like in a majority culture where everyone's expected to make a lot of money and career pressure and all the and an individualistic culture it's almost harder to do things like slow down take time to connect with people support each other eat well rest like all these things are cancer preventative but everyone's looking for yeah like you said a, a silver bullet and it's like it's more obvious and it's more work given the systems we live under to do those basic things like hanging out with your aunt. Yeah. And I, you know, I struggle with that every day as well, because obviously it's so much effort to, um, to do this work. Um, it takes a lot of funding and resources and a lot of maintenance to keep that Mm -hmm. funding going and making sure um, or hoping that we can direct resources and funding and capacity into our communities um, to support these sort of things. And so, you know, it's always, I feel like this uh, interesting conversation of, you know, telling people to take care of themselves. And I've also had to like continue to be like, how am I taking care of myself? Um, What am I doing to also prevent myself from you know, uh, not getting cancer. <laughs> so um, making sure that like, I'm trying to do some of those things as well, uh, take time off, rest, um, you know, be able to engage with my family and community. Um, but that's also part of what I really love about my job is that I get to connect with families and communities. Um, I get to hear their stories. I get to be part of that experience with them um, and engage in some of that. And Again, coming back to traditional values of like compassion and empathy and being able to hear those stories and experience. And sometimes that's all people need is just like, yeah. I need someone else to like hear this. I need someone else to just like be in that space with me and just like hear me. When we started the podcast a few years back and the founder of Cancer Talks was focusing on, she felt like there was, in her cancer experience, she felt kind of alone in trying to approach her journey holistically, including the spiritual experience, the emotional experience, and also thinking about like environmental causes of cancer and all this. And in her own experience, this was a new way of looking at cancer. So that was our languaging in the very beginning was we want to change the conversation or or have a new conversation. And it sort of aligns with science and and Western medicine is now kind of finding ways to prove that there's like a mind-body connection or all these things. But, But there's like a newness to holistic approaches to healing in 
the Western world. These are like considered new concepts, but this is not like a new thing, but something that is just has been indigenous knowledge for a very long time and was kind of like broken by Western medicine. Could you just talk a little bit about an indigenous understanding of healing and how that contrasts with Western concepts of healing? Yeah. And I think, you know, it's it's so integrated. Um, uh, healing is, I feel like, integrated and it's more of a very intricate and complex like system of everything. You know, whereas I feel like within mainstream society and Western medicine, it can be this like this is just the the healing, your physical healing, and that it's separate from mental and emotional and spiritual healing, and that those things aren't necessarily as related because here's what's physically wrong with you and the things that we have tests for and that we can have results on and data and information. And this is like the science of it. But I'm also like, they're discovering new things every day on in terms of those physical aspects and making building new knowledge and information along those lines. And so just because we don't have, you know, that data and information within the the Western medicine field of study doesn't mean that those things don't exist. And I think that's where a lot of our indigenous communities and our uh, traditional healers, they have that information, but they protect it because, Mm -hmm. you know, it it has to be used right. It has to be done right. It's not going to be done for profit or for a lot of those other things. And so I think the ways in which there is overlap between Western and traditional approaches to healing is where, you know, we can go to our community and practice some of those traditional values we have to listen to community and understand what are their needs and priorities how can we help provide support how how can we help them navigate these western systems and structures Uh, how can we help them have better experiences Um, how can we help keep them well informed and educated so that they can make an individual you know decision or choice uh, with all the best information possible because i think that's what it comes back to is that like ultimately i can't really make a decision for someone but Mm -hmm. i want to be able to give them the best information possible because i don't know i i haven't lived every moment of every day of their life um, to know and understand their situation if they're willing to share that with me i can you know provide some perspective or you know my input um but ultimately that's trying to get them to be able to make a good decision for themselves and the act of doing that you know again is like that idea of being a good relative and trying Mm -hmm. to do the best provide the best support uh, do the best work and again, uh, one of those other pieces of, you know, what drives me and motivates me is, you know, I want the very best for my family, my community, and all of those that, you know, ACAF serves or uh, the work that I do, all those populations uh, and community members that it serves. I want to do my very best work so that it can have the, the most impact. And I'm doing that for them, not so much for me um, as an individual, because, that it's not for my individual benefit. Like I do this for, you know, the the well-being of our communities and our relatives, knowing that like I'm part of that and that like it very much has to be a system and like this, you know, I guess holistic or comprehensive approach. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm just one of many that is helping to do a lot of this. So I'm also trying to figure out how can I work better with all the other systems and processes that are already out there instead of trying mm-hmm. to build my own. And like, how do I fit into all of that? And so I think when we start thinking about doing cancer research and cancer prevention work that we have to think about it as a community of how we're supporting each other how we're working together you know i think that's an important and critical aspect of what it means to heal a lot of our because due to the efforts of colonization you know broke those systems and processes down broke them apart you know and created a lot of issues and challenges for our communities you know they put us into reservation boundaries where we weren't able to engage with other communities it broke down our food food systems we couldn't you know practice the the things uh around like um hunting uh gathering 
uh, the foods that we needed, um, our traditional foods in maintaining those diets. Instead, we were given a Western diet that our bodies weren't used to, which again, you know, led to all of these health issues. We look at the, the ways in which our families connected. Um, you know, children were taken from their homelands and taken and put into boarding schools across the country. Um, they were stripped of their language their cultural practices, you know, until what 19, the 1970s, it was yeah. illegal to practice our culture. And I mean, that's another important aspect of looking at some of the ways. Um, one of the biggest influences or factors in cancer is tobacco. Right. And for tobacco, at least in my community, based on the teachings that I've received, um, you know, tobacco is a, one of our traditional medicines, but the way that tobacco is presented and thought of in mainstream society is it's a bad thing. It's very stigmatized. And so th thinking about the irony around that tobacco was taken from us as a medicine, that we weren't allowed to use it. We weren't allowed to have it until after the 1970s. And so a lot of our families and communities or relatives would turn to commercial tobacco. And so they could still access that through through those means. And that's why, you know, there are a lot of Indigenous people who will use commercial tobacco products um, because there's still that connection there. But not knowing and understanding some of the significant and how to use it properly, how to, you know, grow it, um, harvest it, what to do with it. Because oftentimes traditional tobacco isn't inhaled. Um, sometimes it's not even, you know, smoked. It's used for prayer and, um, you know, other cultural practices and different things that are done with it. But again, like that idea that it was taken from us and put into these different products with all these other chemicals, and that's what causes the cancer. But because it's going through that mode, it is, again, stigmatized. And so this is still a way in which our culture and our teachings and knowledge is being taken away from us and and used in ways that aren't appropriate yeah i mean it's almost like gaslighting is such a it's a it's a, right <laughs> we're into like because it's the rat poison that causes cancer right and 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 sure like the addictive chemicals and then people are smoking a pack a day like that's unhealthy but but yeah i mean it's just insane to call tobacco the problem like to make this conflation between what an, an american spirit also i mean we could talk about the appropriation <laughs> of that um and their packaging and everything but yeah to steal the this plant and morph it into something that is actually bad for people and then blame the plant and blame the culture that it came from mm -hmm. and so that's why you know some of the work that one of our other teams um at ACAF will do around like tobacco policy. Um, one of the like most critical and easiest things to do is to clarify like commercial tobacco. Um, because, you know, oftentimes yeah. I remember always seeing like, this is a tobacco free zone, but for a, you know, indigenous community that, you know, does have tobacco as one of our medicines, it's like, that's not necessarily true or culturally appropriate because like, Again, a lot of our uh, relatives will take tobacco with them and they use it for prayer and, you know, strength and, you know, medicine. And so what they mean is like no commercial tobacco products. And so yeah. that's where that emphasis of like, you know, clarify what they mean, because otherwise, when you say no tobacco, you're saying, you know, no medicine for these communities. And mm -hmm. that's one of those things that, again, that connection to that culture, that knowledge and awareness around what how that medicine can help provide healing, you know, to even cancer is, is kind of the irony and all of that. And so it's just like, no, there can be tobacco here. It's traditional tobacco versus commercial tobacco um, and just some of those distinctions. And I think, you know, a lot of the work that ACAF does, but there's a lot of other organizations doing this work as well, um, trying to provide better education on what that is and what that means. And again, th there can be so much of it that's protected still because, you know, there are still efforts to break down that system and processes of what that narrative around tobacco is because mm -hmm. our communities aren't interested in profiting off of those things, um, off of our, our knowledge and our medicines. But there are other, 
I guess, businesses or industries that, you know, don't want that. So um, that's kind of the battle that we're facing. And all we want to do is just like, we're just trying to live and survive and, you know, do all these things. And we are, but I think that's some of that battle again of just trying to be seen or at least, you know, I don't, I mean, I guess maybe not even seen because I don't know that I necessarily need to have these national institutions validate you know i don't need their validation to know that who i am as an indigenous person is real because i already know that to be true like i know my own truths my family my communities we know our own truths and we're going to do those things regardless but i think that's where it comes to you know when people or when institutions want to do like health equity work and all this like work around diversity and inclusion and whatever else that's all part of it these efforts to you know again decolonize data what does that mean um when we do that it's like it's going to take a lot of funding and resources to go into our communities to support the work at that level and so there's there's a lot that can be done around it and I feel like we're still just like waiting for everyone to catch up and just get that very basic one-on-one lesson of like what happened to the indigenous communities here and like why are these disparities, why do they exist um, so that we can basically get to saying amazing things are happening in these communities. They have the solutions. We just need to go fund them. Like, how can we do that? And making sure that our communities also have the capacity to be able to, to do that work. Yeah, which brings us to talking about no strings attached funding and resources and like leaving room for self-determination. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what counts as no strings attached funding? And Yeah, um, so, you know, unrestricted funds play such a critical role in the work that we do through ACAF. Um, so we do a variety of different, you know, uh, fundraising campaigns throughout the year. And that helps us build up the amount of funding that we have available for us to be able to function and do our work, but also helping to provide funding to support things that aren't billable or allowed expenses. And that sometimes, you know, comes in the form of taking care and providing support to our relatives experiencing cancer or their caregivers, you know, helping them to meet their housing needs, their transportation needs, um, trying to get them in the door at the clinic and address some of those barriers that they are experiencing so that we can, you know, hopefully get them in the door to be screened so that they don't have to continue to come back for, you know, treatments and all the different things if they're diagnosed with cancer. So again, a lot of the work that we do in terms of grants, there are certain strings that are attached to them. You know, we have to show certain progress that's made. We have to provide data and information. And it can be a struggle because, again, those are oftentimes built within structures and systems that weren't designed for us to succeed. And it's based on data and information that is not always as relevant or appropriate for our communities. There's non-Native people or institutions defining what those metrics and those goals or deliverables are, and they're not being set by our communities um, that no one understand the factors that go into them. And so that's where, you know, the, these no strings attached funds help to come in so that we can allocate those resources to where they're needed, because it it doesn't always stay the same either. Um, there's changing needs um, mm-hmm. for all of our communities. Sometimes one community needs help and then, you know, uh, and they need one thing and a different community needs something else. Yeah. There's also, um, again, a lot of the the research that happens within established institutions. They have their approach where they want you to have a defined hypothesis. And right. I can't come in with a, a defined hypothesis if I don't know what the, the community wants and needs are. And we can't do that work for free. Like we have to be able to function and pay our staff. Um, and so how do we you know, some it, it's a struggle sometimes to be able to find funders to be able to support that, that, you know, initial work. And it's like we have to prove ourselves and come up with that and, you know, front the costs of that in order to get the data and information to show this is what we need to research. So that's where, um, again, going back to that idea of unrestricted funds of if I was able to, 
to not have a lot of those restrictions and reporting requirements so that I could focus on working in the communities uh, to develop um, programming and efforts to have real impact that that goes a long way. And so, and I, I should also say there have been, you know, some funders that have been a lot more flexible, especially as we've gone through COVID. I think that was a very eye-opening experience for a lot of different mm. institutions of understanding, like, just because you have a plan doesn't mean you're it's going to go according yeah. to that plan. And just being flexible and adaptable of like, this is just where we're at and this is what we have to do and trying to meet the needs of the people that are being impacted. And so I'm really appreciative to the funders that, you know, have been flexible and adaptable uh, to the changing situations because, you know, it, it's not been an easy process. And I think that it's outside of COVID, you know, it's cancer, it's everything, everyone experiences life. And so like, how are we able to, you know, work that into uh, the work that we do and the funding and the reporting requirements or what the strings attached are and trying to just get them to understand some of that. Because again, sometimes that's half the battle is just being like, this is why, you know, we can't do X, Y, Z. Or, I mean, even the idea of like me as where I'm at in my, you know, professional and educational career is a struggle for me to find research funds on my own. I have to go find other people that have PhDs with 10, 15, wow. 20 years of experience to find uh, and be able to get significant funding uh, that's sustainable. Otherwise, it's small amounts of funding that, were that kind of bog us down in reporting and paperwork. Yeah. I'm like, how am I supposed to address all the challenges and issues in the community and do this paperwork? So that's where, again, that unrestricted funding comes in handy uh, and allows us to be able to focus on the needs and priorities that our communities are facing. And so those, you know, I think can come across through direct donations to uh, ACAF. You know, we have links on our website. There's a variety of different campaigns that I've mentioned that you can you can donate through. I think we have an option on Facebook where if you have a your birthday fundraiser can yeah. like those funds can go to ACAF. Um, so there's different ways that individuals, organizations, or health systems can help be involved in this work as well and providing some of that support. But again, I also definitely recognize the reasons for those strings attached you know, funding mechanisms and, you know, those will be there and we'll continue to use those and work with those and try to improve some of those processes um, because they're very much needed. While we also need to have access to those unrestricted funds for, you know, uh, the situations that need the flexibility and adaptability for them. I was going to ask you, how do you process anger or like, how does anger show up for you in your work? Yeah, I think the thing that, you know, really gets me, I guess, in all of this is that that lack of understanding and that idea that, you know, the one size fits all or that we have to, our communities, our relatives have to conform to certain uh, systems or processes or structures, you know, in the similar, it, it's basically still assimilation of like, this is what we have. So you have to make it work yeah. within our system and our approach. Um, again, I can understand uh, different, the way that things are structured right now and that it's hard to, you know, really go in and do a lot of that meaningful change within established systems and structures that things take time. And I think the frustration that I experience is around, like, in all of that, like, our communities and relatives are still struggling as well. And that, um, like, trying to get people to to listen, to he actually hear us, um, hear stories, you know, directly from us and not necessarily have to go through other non-native entities or individuals to trust us and to just, you know, I don't know, see things, I guess, um, from the perspective and experience of that as Indigenous people, we we know the things that are best for the communities that we come from. And oftentimes feeling like, you know, usually sharing the same 
sort of things with people telling the same stories or providing the same history and context and just like you know even the idea that not all native people are the same there's currently you know 574 federally recognized tribes that are sovereign nations with sovereign rights we have treaties in place where it's supposed to be this direct government to government relationship we are a political status we're not just a race or an ethnicity but we have political uh, status and we have you know inherent rights and so that that's a, a unique difference and again that oftentimes it's, you know, many instances in which I've been asked about, you know, what's going on with this tribe over here? And I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not part of that community just because I'm Native doesn't mean that, like, I know and understand all the other things that are going on. And so I'm just like, it's... And it, and sometimes those questions will come up about something that's completely unrelated to cancer or even health or health care. And I'm just like, uh... I don't know what to tell you about that because we're here talking about cancer and cancer prevention and, you know, the work that's going on here. So I think it comes down to like, you know, listening, not assuming things about Native people, um, especially that go back to that deficit based and assuming that Native people are, are just making bad decisions um, or assuming things and understanding, you know, our life experience or um, at least respecting that, you know, we have a different life experience and a different perspective that just because you haven't seen something and proof yourself doesn't mean it's not real or it doesn't exist. In closing, could you share something that gives you hope maybe like for the new year in relation to your work? I think the thing that gives me hope, um, again, that continue or helps to drive me to continue to do the work is when I talk with our community partners and get to engage with them and just hear from uh, people doing the, you know, boots on the ground work and just like all of the the stories and inspiration that they bring, all of the energy, all of just like there's so much amazing work and creativity. And when I get to do that engagement, especially with the youth, and I'm just like, I see that excitement and that drive and that motivation. And so I think for me, it's just when I get to be in community and see those things, hear those stories and see that amazing work that's going on, um, you know, gives me a lot of hope for, you know, the future and that we really do have the opportunity to improve the health and well-being of our communities. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a review in your podcast app. Cancer Talks is a platform for anyone who has been touched by cancer. Write to us at info at cancertalks.com if you have a story to share. If you're moved to donate, please visit cancertalks.com slash donate.